I started speech therapy very young in, in preschool and then all the way up through high school. And during that time, I always felt very isolated uh, socially. I didn't have many friends. And the reason for that is that I was afraid to open my mouth and show my stutter because I was teased relentlessly by the other students. So it definitely affected me um, in that way. But on the flip side, it also pushed me more towards academics as that was something that I could be successful in, in studying for tests and all that and doing well in something. So uh, it did have its silver lining in that regard. Um, so growing up, I pretty much stayed inside the house. I didn't really go out and then meet up with friends in high school. I had one little click and people always spoke to me, but you know, I try to keep a low profile and people try to engage me and I was just very reclusive and some people thought that I just wasn't very interested in them, but that wasn't the case. You know, some people thought that I was rude or selfish, but really I, I was just embarrassed and not being myself and it was extremely frustrating. I, I remember walking home from school and just thinking about all the things I wanted to say through the day, all the missed opportunities and, and it was really agonizing. I grew up in a household where um, studying was actually mocked by family members and so it made me very uncomfortable to speak up and so I was I was very quiet not only there what was supposed to be a safe space but uh, also at school and I remember I was in college and I had floor mates I I, I was living at the University of Maryland my first year and I had some very nice floor mates who wanted me to join them for dinner at the diner and, and I said, oh, no, 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 I, I can't make it. Um, they're like, no, 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 it's, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Uh, but I insisted that I couldn't make it. I would make an excuse about an assignment I had to work on. But then I would end up being at the diner the same time that they were. And I was sitting at a different table. It, it was all of my floor mates. There were like 12 of them at one table. And I was sitting by myself with a Diamondback newspaper, you know, reading as I typically did. And then one of them came over and said, why don't you join us? And I'm like... Oh my God, no, my worst fear, because now everyone is going to hear my stutter and I'm going to be ridiculed and mock and, and I'm going to be ostracized. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so at that point, I couldn't say no, so I had to join the group. And when I got to the group, I just, I didn't have any, any comfort to speak. I just, I gave one word answers and I really didn't feel comfortable talking due to that, you know, whole stigma growing up when I would go to a restaurant, the waiter would look at someone else when they saw me struggling. I could see that people would lose eye contact, that people wouldn't listen to me. I would, I would pick up the phone and people would hang up because I couldn't get the words out. So it, it was definitely a lot, a lot of years of just struggle and frustration um, because I knew or I thought that stuttering was unacceptable. I remember in English class there were presentations and I had to go up and I had to do a rhetorical analysis of a photo in a Time magazine and I got up there and I literally just blocked. I couldn't get more than a couple words out. So after 30 seconds the teacher calls for any volunteers from the class to come up and to perform the rhetorical analysis of the picture that I have picked. So this one student comes up from the class and does a phenomenal job just off the cuff. He didn't prepare anything. And I'm standing there next to him just like, it's so embarrassing. And I got to be on the presentation. And I think, well, I'm just going to get through life just, just using my disability to pass all these presentations. But it was so... Uh, it's definitely not how I wanted to go about it. And then I got to college and I am basing my classes on the syllabus and whether there are going to be presentations later in the semester. So the first couple of years I'm seeing, oh, I have, a, I have one or two presentations. I can't take this class. I'm dropping it. And I'm, I'm going to get a class that, that only has lectures, only has labs. I'm not doing any presentations. But then I get to junior year and you have to take junior English to graduate from college. And there's a presentation in it. So I get the syllabus the first day and I mark that date. And I've just got so much anxiety, even though this presentation is eight weeks away. Mm -hmm. And as the weeks get closer, the anxiety builds up and builds up. And I just wake up with anxiety. I go to sleep with anxiety about something coming up in a week, something I've been avoiding for years. And 
I finally get to the day I have too much nerves to even eat breakfast and I love eating. <laughs> and I get to class and it's finally my turn and I, I just feel like earth stops rotating and uh, I slowly step up to the front. I have my cue cards and I literally, I'm, I'm choking on my own breath. I can't breathe. I can't get any air out and I have these massive armpit stains growing. I have sweaty palms that are shaking and I, I sputter out a couple words. And then at that point, my typical pattern is to postpone and I just get stuck, right? I'm like a, like a car that's out of gas. And not even that though, it's just my jaw tremoring as I'm up there. And, and I see everyone watching me and I just feel like I'm crumbling into dust on the ground. And I just, I just look down, I grab my cards and I walk off and go, back to my seat and I slither down so far into the seat. I just want to disappear. I, I wish at that point that a huge sinkhole would just swallow me up because the embarrassment was like a tidal wave. And then after what seemed like 30 seconds of silence, the professor goes, all right, next student. And it was at that point that I realized that I was not going to be able to become a physical therapist if I couldn't even speak in front of 20 classmates. And, uh, it was at that point that I sought out speech therapy again, and it was a different type of therapy where it was about attacking your fears as opposed to letting them control you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that really changed the trajectory of my life at 21 years old. And, and since that time, I've not only become a physical therapist, but I've, I've become a pretty good one. Um, I've, I've finished a residency program where I presented to a high-ranking physical therapist all over the nation, uh, over, over the interwebs, and now, um, I also speak at a Toastmasters meetings as a president, and so I've, I've really attacked what was once a weakness and turned it into a strength. So I can attest to the uh, poor practicality of fluency shaping therapy as I received that through all of grade school. And I remember sitting in the office and the therapist would tell me to use those easy onset techniques such as rolling my finger along a wave on the table, and she would count my syllables and tap on the computer as she heard fluencies and disfluencies. And we did it in September and then we did it again in April or May. And she told to me, she told me in May that I have reduced my disfluencies by 30%. I'm doing so much better. And, and I thought to myself, oh, that's, that's great. Uh, how come I haven't noticed it? out in class, out at home, uh, there was zero uh, reach. And I, I think that trying to increase fluency is not the way to go about it because fluency is not something that you can control, but rather the amount of uh, the amount of eye contact you have and, and the way you're engaged in talking to someone and listening to someone and giving eye contact. I knew that during that time that I was avoiding eye contact. And quite frankly, it was probably the same sample of, of text that I was reading in September all the way out to May. So practicing the same words for so many months. And I, I, think, it's, I think it's misguided. And I think that I think counseling is required and, and also acknowledging people's feelings because stuttering is not just about the motor aspect, right? There's a lot of cognitive and affective components to stuttering that I think are just being ignored, which leads to a lot of frustration from stutterers. As, as young kids, they feel misunderstood. And so I, I think that coming about it with a more holistic approach and seeing them as a person, what their goals are and what they want to be able to do. Do, do they want to give a presentation? Do they want to speak up at a friend's party? So what would you have liked to work on at that time? Put yourself back in that situation in school. What would you have liked her to help you with? I would have liked for her to help me with accepting stuttering because at that point she was encouraging me to try to stop something that the neurologically, I'm inclined to do. It's like I come in in a wheelchair, I'm paralyzed from the waist down, and she's telling me how they're gonna get me inside of a contraption that takes one hour to get into, an hour to get out, and I'll be able to walk for one minute. 
why not just teach me how to uh, access my environment and a, and a community with what I have? So really, I, I, think, I think it should have been a conversation of about what you want to get out of it and to uh, listen, you know, I think is important. Yeah. Listen to the client. Could you have had that conversation when you were a kid, Nelson? When I was in middle school? You know, I think I, think I could have. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. yeah, I think if they had given me the avenue, I don't think I would have proactively uh, volunteered that, but I think that's the therapist's job is to seek that out from the client. I'm gonna put you on the spot. Okay. What could she have asked you that, if you can go back then, what could she have asked you that would have made you feel safe enough to say that you didn't want to be doing, you didn't want to be counting those deficiencies and calling that success? I think asking how stuttering makes you feel, mm -hmm. how does it affect your day? There was none of that. As, as Tracy said, they pull you into this little closet and they would say, okay, now it's time for your fluency shaping. And I think engaging in conversation about feelings and thoughts about your study, what your worries are, where you want to be at the end of the year. Um, because quite frankly, I could ha ha have a very high frequency of stuttering and be very forward moving where people understand me and I'm in engaged in the conversation. Or I could have very low fluency and or, or I could have very low or very good fluency and have a showstopper where I'm unable to say my name. Mm -hmm. So I, I would much rather have high frequency and stutter through the day as opposed to being asked what my name is and going my name is My name is, uh, my name is, my name is, my name is Nelson. How does that feel to do that now? It was weird. <laughs> That's how I used to speak. That was how I've yeah. been spoken like wow. that in, in 12 years, man. Yeah. I was going into a Froyo line um, in Baltimore and I had my girlfriend with me and I said, I'm gonna do a, a speech assignment. So the guy is probably gonna look at you for help when I start to stutter, but don't talk, okay? Mm -hmm. She's like, okay, I'm all about it. Mm -hmm. she, she was excited and very supportive. And, and I, I went in there with so much uh, desensitization that I wasn't very concerned, but I thought more so this is going to be desensitization for her and also it would probably just make the the attendant more uncomfortable mm -hmm. than me, right? Because at this point I've been in avoidance reduction therapy for a few years. And so in the past I would have thought, oh my God, this person must think I'm an idiot and they're going to have no respect for me and I'm just uh, just an incompetent human being and I'm going through, I'm stuttering, I want the ch 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 chocolate chips, I want the mm -hmm. or or Oreos. And then I get I get to the end of the line, and the guy's asking for my phone number. <laughs> uh, he asked, I had a Tough Mudder shirt on, he asked uh, about that, and so he was actually engaging me in conversation, and I think that what it showed was that I was being confident with my stutter, and this gentleman thought that I, I was attractive, but then I had my girlfriend there too, and now there's this dynamic where she's like, hey, well, I'm right here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't be hitting on my guy right in front of me. Right. And so it ended up not being like really a speech assignment right, no. at all, but it was just a whole other dynamic. But it just goes to show how stuttering used to be something that controls your life and it dictates every little decision that you make. And literally you're hanging out with your friends, you guys are going to a restaurant, everyone's chit-chatting, having a good time, and you're freaking out about how am I gonna order what I want? What can I say fluently that's on the menu? And you just can't enjoy any moment. And to just be in the moment and, and to laugh at situations mm -hmm. was just really nice to see it come full of 180. So uh, several years ago, uh, I was asked to uh, deliver a, a keynote speech by a large nonprofit organization in the metropolitan DC area. And I was absolutely afraid of doing this. So I knew I had to do it. So I said, sure, I'll do it. And I think it also speaks to my communication skills, the fact that they asked me to do it. But at the time, I was just petrified. and. 
you know about my previous experiences with presentations. I've avoided these my entire life growing up. And then I actively worked on it and, and overcame that fear. Um, and, this, and this keynote speech was a big part of it. So I was given a month to prep this speech. I went in, I spoke with the vice president of the company. I did it in front of her a couple of times, many different revisions. And I did it in front of friends and family. Everyone was so supportive. And it, it was nice to be able to come into group and tell people that I, was, that I had this coming up. And everyone was just so encouraging. And they were um, accountable with me and following up. And so the day comes. And, uh, and I'm, I'm at the gala dinner for the fundraiser. I know I'm going to speak. And I kind of have this really nice dinner in front of me. But I can't eat it, mm -hmm. right? So this is like we're going back to junior English, right? Mm -hmm. I can't eat it. I got so many nerves, mm -hmm. right? But then I remember something that someone in the group told me. He said that it, when he gets all this, all this uh, anxiety, he channels it into positive en energy. Mm -hmm. And so... I thought that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna use this, and I'm gonna use it for for energy. I'm I'm gonna bottle up these feelings um, and use it productively. So I get called up to the front, and I look out to everyone. Right, I'm taking this moment in. I'm at the podium, and I have all these people and these rich, successful people. We got CEOs of of, of international corporations sitting here, and and I look out at them, and I. And I project and I command and I make eye contact and I stutter and people freaking mm -hmm. loved it, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. At the end, I got a standing ovation. Mm -hmm. The uh, owner of this nonprofit organization, she comes up, she gives me a big hug and it ended up being the most successful fundraiser they've ever had. Wow. And, and, they, and they raised six figures that mm -hmm. night, uh, mm -hmm. which is better than they ever did. Growing up, I was petrified of getting married, right? So I never thought I could get it up in front of my friends and family and say, I do. I would I'd stutter and block on the word and people would think he doesn't really want to get married to her. <laughs> and so uh, growing up, I was just petrified of talking to any girl my age and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And I went, I, I went through life just avoiding dating, never went out, you know, Friday nights I'd stay home and read books. And um, then I went to avoidance reduction therapy and, and my therapist Vivian Siskin was talking about the fear hierarchy. And for me, I had presentations and talking to women, mm -hmm. right? And, and I was, and, and I started getting addicted to overcoming these fears because it was so much fun. You'd go out there, you'd do it. And so I wanted to, wanted to go after it. I wanted to tackle this. So I was going to desensitize to stuttering, not only in front of strangers, but in front of women simultaneously. So I set up, uh, I, I set myself up on some dating apps and I prepared to go on 100 dates in six months. So <laughs> my Saturday looked like a date at 3 p.m., 5 p.m., 7 p.m., 9 p.m., 11 p.m. And I would organize them so that they were in a location that was close to each other. So I would walk, I'd meet someone at the National Zoo, I would, I would hang out with them and I'd be like, oh, sh I gotta get going to this next date. So I'd be like, you know, I, I gotta go. And then I'd show up with someone else and I was, I was just emotionally exhausted from that last interaction. I was like, oh, here we go again. Gotta introduce myself, tell my spiel. And it was just listening reactions and meeting new people and the, the stress of like them coming out and meeting me. So there was just so many layers and by, by midnight, I was just so emotionally exhausted. I was, I couldn't talk to anyone else. But then you do this a week later, it becomes a little bit easier, right? And then by a month, you're like, this ain't so bad. And then by the end of it, now I'm out at, at events and gatherings and I have no issues starting small talk with anyone. I've grown so comfortable and it was due to focused assignment-based um, practice mm -hmm. targeted going after the goal and the goal was to stutter with 100 women and I did that and the outcome was now I feel free to communicate with not only women but men uh, authority figures mm -hmm. and it, it, it was a lot of fun in the process. <laughs>